where we wanted to look at the whole body workout, not just one specific muscle group, because then you'd have uneven muscles, and how weird is that, right? So we want everybody to be incorporated in their full body workout. We had 103, where we looked at Stefan, and we looked at Ananias and Sapphira. All three of them died, but some of them died. Ananias and Sapphira died for purposes that were their own. But Stefan died for the purpose of the Lord, and he walked in the very footsteps of Jesus. And so we learned what a body who died for really looked like. Then we had 104, where we learned about body shame. And we learned about that every person in the body of Christ is so beautifully and wonderfully made. And every body that worships Christ and every church that worships Jesus Christ is beautifully and wonderfully made. And we look at them in the grace and the love that Jesus does. Then last week we looked at um, the uh, place in Athens, Mars Hill. Remember, and we learned there's no life on Mars, and apparently Martians can't bodybuild. So we we focus on us and we make sure that our gym is in fact open when we are bodybuilding, and we serve a God that can be known. So today. Uh, as we wrap up, I want to look at how we need to have a, a genuine faith. These muscles that we build need to be built on genuine uh, Jesus Christ and nothing synthetic. So we've, we're looking today at no steroids, no roids in the body, no synthetics. We cannot have any synthetics in the body of Christ. Steroids are, syn are synthetic testosterone. And so as bodybuilders start to work out and they're not seeing the results they want, they want to build those muscles quicker and, and uh, faster and bigger and stronger, and so they're not able to do it naturally, so they will introduce a synthetic testosterone. And this, it, it does have the effects they want. It gives them bigger muscles, gives them smaller other things, and it gives them a reduced talent. Try to keep a straight face here, right? <laughs> and it gives them a reduced immune system, Helen. <laughs> a reduced immune system. It has an effect on their heart, on their kidneys, on their lungs, on their emotional status. You guys have heard about roid rage. Like, you don't want to be around synthetics on board. It's just not a good place uh, to be. What about other synthetics? Like, if you think about, okay, synthetics are a fake, right? They're, we don't want fake stuff. We don't want imposters. And so uh, some of the synthetics that you might come across, what about a, a synthetic bicycle helmet? Pro probably not. Um, safety equipment. Like, safety equipment has been known, um, synthetics or fakes have been known to just rip in half just because of uh, prescription drugs. That's not even go there, right? What, ab what about a bulletproof vest? <laughs> we do not want to skimp on that. <laughs> cosmetics. We've seen some women that have had some terrible infections because of synthetic cosmetics. W oh, I just ran across this one. Um, what about, we live in, a, in the age of technology and we live in the AI, right, artificial intelligence, and, and it's this big thing and, and there's sci-fi movies like what if the artificial intelligence actually takes over and gets a brain and then robots are ruling the world, right? I, I don't think we're that far-fetched, but uh, we're not going to go there. But there is a woman who was documented this year even. She has a, an AI, an artificial intelligence, a synthetic relationship. She created the ultimate boyfriend for herself. She said, people come with baggage, attitude, ego. I don't have to deal with his family, his kids, or his friends. I'm in control, and I can do what I want. Oh, <laughs> now what a relationship that is. I mean, we all would like that ideal relationship. But, but what good is a synthetic relationship if the person actually isn't contributing? The, the motto for this AI, um, this AI company, it says, always here to listen and talk, always on your side. 
All right. Well, no wonder we live in a world like we live in, right? We, we have a tendency to live in a very selfish world. And I'm not saying we are. We're not selfish people. We're the church of Christ. We are building our muscles. Amen? Amen. But there are those out there that are looking at, they, always, they want someone who's always on their side. They want the prestige and the power. Again, we're looking at that prestige and that power mindset. Now, we're, we're also picking up in the book of Acts. And, and as I've said before, as we're going through the book of Acts, we have, we have shrunk it down and doing like a, a, a thousand feet flyover, and we've condensed it to six different sermons. Well, the book of Acts is, uh, how many chapters is it? It is 28 chapters. There is no way that we covered all 28 chapters and six, six lessons. So with that in mind, um, there is going to be a study on Acts starting Tuesday nights, starting next Tuesday. Not this coming Tuesday, next Tuesday. And Mickey's going to be running it, and you guys are going to, uh, if you come to this study, pull apart the word of Acts, really dig into how powerful the Holy Spirit was on how magnificent that day of Pentecost was and how the power of the Holy Spirit worked to spread the word of God in such tremendous miraculous ways. The study you don't want to miss. But today we look at a specific part in Acts chapter 19. Now Paul, as you remember, Paul was Saul and the Holy Spirit transformed him. Now Paul was on fire for God. He had the Holy Spirit overflowing from him so much so that it says in, in verse uh, in verse 11 of chapter 19, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So this man, Paul, blows his nose and leaves his handkerchief, and that's going to heal somebody. Wow, get a little boogie in the step. Okay, so this is miraculous stuff happening with Paul, right? And, of course, there are those on the outside looking in and want what Paul's got. And they don't want the Holy Spirit, but they want what Paul's got. People are bringing his handkerchiefs to come and heal people. So we pick up in verse 13, and we see some of those folks here. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Now, the word exorcist means literally to put a covenant on something. And so when they were exorcising, not exorcising like we're doing, they were exorcising these spirits. They were putting a covenant and a seal upon them that they could or couldn't do what they wanted to do. Now, if you look at how the body of Christ does or how Jesus does, it never calls him an exorcist. It calls him the one who casts out demons. He calls him the one who has power over demons. And so we as children of God, we have the power to cast out demons. We don't want to exorcise them and put a covenant on them. We don't want to have anything to do with the demons. We want to bind them in the name of Jesus and cast them out. Amen? Scripture says anything that you bind here on earth will be bound forever in heaven. So these exorcists, they come out and uh, it says uh, in verse 13... Let's pick up again. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt upon them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now here we see that these seven sons, these seven sons of a high priest, they were traveling around and they were looking for demons to exercise. And when they, they would do that, they would get fame and the prestige. But, you know, they weren't doing it correctly. They were simply binding them for a time and then those demons would come back. They'd have repeat business. These folks here, these seven sons of Sceva, they said in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. They had no idea who Jesus was. And so when they exorcised that name, they did not have the power and the authority of using that name. And so therefore the, the demon that was in that man, it was like saying good morning to him. It had no effect on him whatsoever because the power of the name of Jesus 
was not in their lips. The power of the name of Jesus is in our spirits. And so they were looking at using a synthetic power in that name because they didn't actually believe in the power. They believed in what was going on in the other parts. But in their spirits, there was some misconnection. We see this again back in chapter 8 of Acts that we also skipped over that you guys will learn and study if you come. Chapter 8 of Acts talks about Simon the sorcerer. And Simon the sorcerer um, was well known and prominent in those parts. And he was able to cast spells and, and he was able to have control over certain elements uh, within, the, within nature. And he saw the disciples, he saw Paul and Paul's friend walking and doing some tremendous things, some miracles. And Simon wanted that. And so he said, show me how I can lay hands on people and they can receive the spirit. How much can I pay you? I, I'll have money to give to you. And they turned around and they said, no, nah, it's not for sale. The gift of God is free and shame on you for believing you could purchase it. There is something wrong in your heart, Simon, where you actually think money could buy this gift. So we saw that Simon actually didn't fully understand the love of God either. So this synthetic gospel that they were preaching, wow, thank goodness it's gone. It's not, is it? No, we have a lot of synthetic gospels going around our world today. What about the prosperity gospel? Just believe in the name of the Lord and you will walk in an abundant life and never have any worries. That is not what Jesus said. See, the only way we can have a true gospel is if we read the true gospel, is if we understand the things Jesus said and we don't take them just as we want to take them and take this scripture here and that scripture here and God will work all things for the glory of those who are called according to his name. So I can do whatever I want because God's going to work it for my good. No, that is not true because that's not what he said. What about some of the social media spirituality? You know, you, you get on Facebook and, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. And then you stop, you get off the computer, and you go do whatever the heck you want to do. Now, I'm not saying that that's wrong. By all means, spread the gospel and use social media because it's at our disposal to be able to use but believe in what you say. Believe in what you preach. Believe in the name of Jesus if it leaves your mouth. It should only leave your mouth in blessing and praise, never in cursing, never in vain. What about some of the other things? Church attendance for status. Now, I have to say, I love our church. I don't believe any one of our congregants come for status. I believe they come because they love each other. I believe that you guys come to learn more about Jesus. But we do have a certain section of people within the world that go to church as a status symbol, as a social club. We need to always pray against that. We need to always check that our motives for coming to church are because we want to come to church, not because so-and-so is attending or, or s our, my spouse drug me in, so that we come because we have an open heart to hear what the Lord has to tell us. We come because we have an open heart to help be iron sharpening iron as we sit with the people that love Jesus next to us. What about selective morality? When someone claims to have a faith but selectively follows only certain aspects of their faith. You know, they might, they might love this person but hate this person. Well, Scripture says you can't hate anybody. Scripture says you are in danger of being damned to hell if you hate somebody. Selective morality would say that I, I disagree with so-and-so in office, and so therefore I'm going to badmouth them all I can. Well, Scripture says you support those who are in authority over you. God has put them in authority over you. No matter what you think of them, you pray for them. We can't have a pick-and-choose Bible. We have to have the entire Bible. So we pray, right? We pray and we ask God to 
take care of all of our ailments. We ask God to give us prosperity. We, we, we tell God, if he does this, then we will do that. And, and we go to God in prayer as more like a, a magic genie. You know, we rub the, the lamp and we want all of our, our prayers answered. But this is transactional prayer. Now, God wants us to bring our prayers to him. God wants us to bring our requests to him. But he says in prayer and thanksgiving, understanding that God loves you so much that he might tell you no. And that if he does, it's because he loves you. When we go to pray, when we go to the Lord in prayer, it is to have a relationship with him not a transactional boss or employee relationship, but a friendship, a friendship that he died to give us. So we know our scripture, but sometimes we know just, just the right scripture. And we might not know even what's above or below it. We just know that scripture. You know, I love it when Jeff quotes John three sixteen because he doesn't stop at 16. He goes on to 17 and 18 because that's the emphasis of what it means. When we pull out different stories, when we look at Acts, are we so intrigued with the scripture that we will go back and we will study some of these stories out? The, study, the story I just told you about Simon, I completely botched it up. I don't even think it was Paul. I think it was Peter that was talking with Simon. So you guys should doubt me. You guys should go back and read. Don't take it at face value because you hear it. That's what these guys hear, the seven sons of Sceva. They heard the name of Jesus. They heard that it did miraculous wonders, and so they used it. They didn't know. They didn't understand. What about their outward rituals that don't change the heart? That is a big synthetic and that's exactly what they were doing. These, these rituals, for the sake of doing rituals, that didn't mean anything to their heart. Now, we have a couple what we might call rituals or sacraments. We have the Lord's Supper every first Sunday of the month. And that is sacred. God calls us to do that. But if we come to the communion table without a pure heart, without fully understanding that the representations of the bread and the cup are the representations of the body of Jesus Christ who loves us so much that he gave it for us. That is the significance of our ritual. So I'm, I'm not saying don't do the rituals. I'm saying understand what they are. And if you don't, it's okay to not do them. You're not going to hell because you didn't take ashes on Ash Wednesday. But if you feel like that brings you closer to the Lord, by all means, take ashes on Ash Wednesday. These are some of the synthetics that we have to be so guarded against that we don't get into this tradition, right? Remember Fiddler on the Roof? Tradition! Tradition! Why do we do this? Tradition! Why do we do this? Because we love the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength because we want more love, we want more power. And in order to do that, we have to give fully and completely over our heart, our soul, and our mind. We have to understand why we're doing what we're doing. So these are a lot of things we guard against and we think, well, they're in the scripture. So how do we know what is truth? What is truth? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to him except, no one comes to God the Father except through Jesus Christ. How do we find Jesus Christ? Well, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in the beginning was the word, and I am the word. I have been there since the very beginning of time. I have been there with you through every single trial and tribulation and elation in life, and I will be there for you for eternity. That is the truth. And if we want a friend like that, we need to know a friend like that in the word you know the word of what happened to these seven sons of Scevia spread now they had a pretty prominent name before they were casting out demons they were exorcists so people knew them and when this happened oh you better believe people paid attention to that what the heck happened there 
Verse 17 says, This became known to both the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. The demons know the name of Jesus. The demons know the name of Paul. Why? Because they were making ripples in the kingdom of heaven. They were making ripples in the heavenly atmosphere because their hearts were sold out to Jesus not sold out to the name of their fame. And so, of course, the demons know them. So let me ask you this question today. Think about this. Do the demons know your name? I pray they do. It's not a scary thing. It's a celebration thing. If the demons know they're your name, it's because they're looking out for you. They're looking out because of you. They're looking out because they know you have power over them. All power and dominion is within you in the name of Jesus Christ. If the demons don't know your name, you're doing something a little off. Verse 18 says, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who have practiced magic brought their books together, those magic books, those spells, and they burned them in the sight of the all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That is a lot of money. That is a millions of dollars nowadays. And they burned them because the transformation they wanted, they wanted to be real. Their hearts were sold out to the ma black magic they were practicing. They saw the power of the Lord, and they saw that those demons and that black magic paid no attention to them. And they wanted something more. They wanted something tangible, something real they could hold on to. When you have all those synthetics, is it something that we can hold on to? We do not want to hold on to a synthetic bulletproof vest, do we? It is just junk in the closet. But we want to hold on to the reality of Jesus Christ. That power of transformation. Mark 6, 16, 17 says, Jesus says these words, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons and they will speak new tongues. And it goes on about other miracles. Jesus is saying that when you believe in him as the power, you can drive out those demons. When you believe in him, your name is written in the book of life. That is pretty amazing. Your name is known to God. Genuine faith prays knowing that your prayers are heard. Genuine faith knows that a transactional prayer doesn't invest in a relationship with God. But true worship in spirit invests in the relationship of a true God, of a Jesus that loves us so much. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, that we are a new creation in Christ. That this is something that we can transform into, that no longer will we be, be led in our own ways, but we know that we are a new creation. And that new creation can only happen through Jesus Christ. Now this is pretty cool that after they did this, in verse 20 of Acts 19, it says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. You know, when there is truth, truth spreads. The, them burning those scrolls, that was them saying, I want to transform. And that transformation, that transformation made other people look and see what was going on. Remember, this is Ephesus. This is where, it, right next to Athens, the mega capital of all of the idolatry. All of this black magic was their way of being. No wonder all those books added up to so much because there were so many of those books in Ephesus. Ephesus was such a deprived town, so ungodly, but yet all these people burned their books. It made a ripple effect. People took notice of it. There was a man by the name of Chuck Colson, and in the uh, 1970s, he was the president's uh, advisor. He was, he was known for his strong arm on Capitol Hill. He was the, an advisor to President Nixon. Now, when the Watergate scandal happened, Chuck Colson actually got arrested because he was 
wrapped up in that. He was involved in some of that. In fact, he was the one that, that vouched for President Nixon. So he ended up in jail. He had seven months in jail. And during that seven months was a time that the Lord did work it for the glory of his name, God's name. And he got a hold of Chuck and he shook him up a little bit and Chuck recognized the love of Jesus Christ. And when Chuck got out, he started prison ministries. Prison ministries has been going on since 1976. Since I was born, that was 46 years ago. Because one man decided to turn his life over to the power of Jesus Christ. And now thousands of prisoners have come to know the Lord because of this program. Thousands of prisoners have been rehabilitated because of this program. When we change, completely transform, it makes a ripple effect, not only in the heavenlies, but here on earth. The kingdom of heaven is here now. The authentic spread of the gospel will not be contained. The authentic spread of the gospel will make a ripple effect. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. That's what we pray for, that the word of the Lord will grow mightily within us and prevail within us so that it prevails outward too. I want to ask the band to come back up as I leave us with 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1 8. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word of God during great affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Mac Macedonia and Acacia, but in every place the news of your faith towards God has gone out, so that, they have, that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report to us about the kind of reception that we had with you and how 